Hi everyone. So I'm Pierre Chevalier. I work for MadeSafe. Uh, I've been working here for a bit under a year. Uh, and since I've joined, I've been working on Parsec, which is our consensus protocol. Um, I was involved in the, since the early stages of design, and now I'm leading the team that's uh, developing it and bringing it to production. So today that's what my talk is going to be about. But if you don't know what the safe network is, the one-line version is it's a data and communications network that's decentralized and encrypted. And the reason we are building that is to give back to everyone the privacy, security, and freedom that they've lost in today's internet. Um, so the title of this talk is Beyond Blockchain, Parsec, Bringing Consensus to the Next Level with Rust. And because I'm lazy, the plan is going to be tackle each section of the title one by one. Uh, so wh why do I say beyond blockchain? What do I mean? Well, now we're in late 2018. So I'm guessing that everyone has heard of blockchain. And maybe some of the connotations it has are not very good anymore. Uh, maybe when I say blockchain, you think it's a buzzword. Uh, maybe you think there are tons of high volatility assets, which are a good way to lose your mortgage. Uh, maybe you're thinking uh, some projects are subpar in quality. Maybe you're thinking a lot of actors in the blockchain space are just straight up scammers. Uh, maybe you're thinking pop and dumps, etc. There are lots of negative uh, connotations that have uh, arisen in the last few years. But I'd like for you to remember what you thought of blockchain when you discovered the concept. Uh, like, for instance, when you first read the Bitcoin white paper, whenever that was. And when I think of blockchain, I remember that on the basis, it was one simple and elegant idea that could be expressed in only a short white paper, only nine pages, mostly plain English, barely any maths, uh, pictures in the, in the nine pages. Uh, and with that white paper, we had a way to remove the need for trust in money, in the issuance of currency and in validating transactions. And so uh, that idea was extremely powerful. Uh, it, it allowed us from a system where you needed, if you wanted to send cash electronically to trust some third party, then you could just have two people on other sides of the planet download a piece of software, it runs some protocol and they exchange money and it's nobody's business. Uh, so for that reason, blockchain became kind of a, a breaking change in, in society. And that's why then there has been all the success and all the negative consequences of the success as well. Um, and so the, the big idea behind blockchain, of course, was the proof of work, which acts partly as a consensus mechanism. So it solves the double spend problem uh, with proof of work. You can know that someone is not uh, sp spending the same money twice. And another aspect of proof of work is that it's a civil mechanism. So if you want to do anything malicious on a blockchain, if you try to spawn 100,000, a million fake identities, it doesn't change anything because you need the hash rate to control over half the hash rate of the network. Um, so that was kind of the, the big innovation. Now, why am I even speaking about blockchain? It's a bit cheeky because what we do at MadeSafe is not blockchain based, has no blockchain anywhere, but it's just as an introduction of how simple math can just have big societal impacts. Uh, and while blockchain was being worked on, so the, the white paper, the Bitcoin white paper was released in 2008, already since 2006 in Scotland, uh, a man called David Irvin had been thinking of similar problems in a different space. And the question he was trying to answer is, how can we remove trust from the internet? And turns out that's a bit more complicated than removing trust in finance, because you've got many layers to the internet, from DNS, from peer-to-peer -peer connection, or say connection layer. Um, it, there, there is many, many parts to this problem. Uh, but the fundamental thing you need to do is to remove the server. Uh, the, the server is a place where the NSA can put a prism and because all your data transits by these big data centers, they can see everything that you're doing. And it's a place that's a honeypot for all kinds of hackers to take down 
and to get access to your data. Um, so th by removing the server uh, and by creating this network, we, which we call the safe network, we want to procure, procure secure access for everyone. That's what uh, safe stands for. Uh, but of course, if you remove the server, you need some way to get, for instance, if you, if you want to request data from the network, you need some way to get that data back, but without the trust in a server. And so that trust comes in the form of a number of servers cooperating together, reaching consensus, and what you rely on is that a fraction of these uh, computers is honest, a big enough fraction is honest. Uh, so yeah, the safe network, we're trying to build a network for humans based on human values, such as respecting your privacy, um, and a network that's built in collaboration. So Made Safe is currently the company that's working on the project, but it's also open source, and we invite everyone to participate in building this thing as well. Um, if it succeeds, it's kind of bigger than a company or, or an individual. Um, so yeah, the safe network has many parts to it. Uh, one part is actually called CRUST, Connections in Rust, which is uh, a bit similar to libp2p that Pierre gave a talk about before. Um, but anyway, so if you want to learn about all these uh, parts of the safe network, I'd recommend you check out our website, safenetwork.tech. And from now on, I'm going to be focusing on Parsec in this talk. Uh, so Parsec is a consensus protocol. So I'll just give you a um, one line about a consensus protocol. You've got a number of computers that see things happening, and they need to decide on the order in which they happen. Uh, so everyone could propose an order, but because of uh, latency and stuff, they could see things genuinely in different ways. Uh, and then it's Byzantine fault tolerant if it uh, is resilient to malicious actors trying to break the protocol while honest nodes are trying to uh, agree on the next value. So for our uses in the safe network, uh, we needed a consensus protocol that was asynchronous because we want to do, we want to do an internet scale uh, thing. So you d you'd have no guarantee about latency in any case. Uh, you could have all kinds of weird things. So if you rely on timing, you're likely to introduce security vulnerabilities for later. Uh, we wanted something that's scalable, again, internet scale, so uh, something that's permissionless. So on one hand, it means being uh, resilient to malice, and on another hand, it means being able to accommodate nodes joining and leaving the, sec the um, section of the network uh, while consensus is happening. Of course, we wanted it to be open source because the entire safe network, the entire stack is a number of open source modules. Uh, and that's by uh, its intended. And we wanted it to be simple, not only because of math snobism, although that's a part of it, but uh, also because simplicity in an algorithm means security, because it means that other people can review the algorithm and they can convince themselves it's correct. And you don't have to uh, like have some kind of weird loopholes in the middle. Uh, so now I'll, g I'll explain how Parsec works. But first, I'll give you the recipe ahead of time. Um, so recipe, first you use gossip. Then you build a directed acyclic graph of your gossip communications. Then uh, we'll define the concept of an observer. And with this concept of an observer, you can reduce the problem of uh, general uh, Byzantine fault tolerant protocol to a simpler problem. I'm not going to tell you which simpler problem yet, because else you can just leave the room and I'm speaking to no one. Uh, so first, uh, gossip. Gossip is a way of communicating in a network that's both efficient and resilient. Um, so I'll give you two examples of what's, what's an efficient way, what's a resilient way, and then show why gossip is a good middle ground. So uh, an efficient way to communicate between nodes is everyone sits in a circle, everyone communicates data to the node on their right, until everyone has seen the data. And the cost of this is n communications to share a message between n nodes. Um, so that's very efficient. However, if any node stops playing ball, uh, the message will be lost. So it's absolutely not resilient. Uh, 
a way to communicate information in a network that's resilient is broadcast. So that end nodes all send all the information they know to everyone, but then the cost of propagating a message between end nodes is n squared, which is not efficient. So gossip is a middle ground where nodes just send data randomly to a node every now and then. And it turns out with that randomness, the, the property you get is messages get propagated in n log n, uh, like n being the number of nodes. And on another hand, you're very resilient because malicious nodes don't know who to hinder or like who to target if they want to uh, stop you communicating. Uh, and so statistically, it will always make its way through anyway. They cannot just stop everyone at the same time. <coughs> uh, sorry about that. Okay, so, so in Parsec, the nodes communicate through gossip. And uh, that allows them to build then a gossip graph. So that's a directed acyclic graph that records the communications that happened in the network. Um, and then to, to reach agreement on the next value, the question is going to be from looking at what I see of the gossip graph, what's the next value? And if I do this, I want for everyone else to see the same thing. Um, so gossip graph, let's take an example because it's easier to visualize than explain in the abstract. We've got four nodes here called Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave. Um, and when things happen in the network, nodes will create an event, a gossip event, to record that something happened. So an example of this is another node wants to join these four nodes and uh, issues a message and say, Bob sees this message. And so he records that, creating a gossip event that says, OK, say Eric wants to join the party. Uh, and then, like, because it's gossip, someone will randomly pick someone else to communicate. Here, Bob picks Carol. And when Carol receives uh, this communication, so Bob sends her his, what he knows of the gossip graph at the moment, and she creates a gossip event that has the hash of what he sent her and the hash of her oldest event. Um, and say, no, maybe Bob picks Alice, maybe Alice picks Bob again, uh, and you can communicate like this randomly and build a bit of a graph. Uh, so this is just big enough to show a few concepts uh, and define the concept of observer, so I'm going to stop here. Um, just for explaining concepts in the next few slides, I'm giving a name to the gossip events. Uh, so I'm naming them from the initial of the node and then 0, 1, 2 going up in the graph. So the oldest one is A0, the oldest one by Alice, for instance. Um, so now we want to define the concept of observer because you'll see that it allows to simplify the problem of uh, ABFT or Byzantine Fault Tolerant Protocol. Uh, and we'll start by defining the concept of seeing. So, well, the very simplest way uh, gossip event, so seeing is a relationship between two gossip events. And the very simplest way a gossip event can see another gossip event if, is if the other gossip event is itself. So each gossip event sees itself. And then the next simplest way is if uh, the other gossip event is a self-parent or another parent. So for instance here, A1 sees C0 because uh, C0 is the other parent of A1. So the other parent is the di diagonal relationships in this graph. Um, and then it's transitive. So for instance, C2 sees B0 because uh, basically B0 is an ancestor of C2 in this graph. Uh, but currently I've just defined the notion of being an ancestor in a directed acyclic graph. Uh, and where there is a difference with the concept of seeing is in the case of forks. Uh, so a fork is if a node creates, it's like a double span basically, it's if a node creates two gossip events that have the same um, self-parent. And this is malicious behavior, so it, it should not happen by honest nodes, but it can happen because we are in a Byzantine setting. Uh, and so the definition of seeing changes in, in this case. Uh, just a little side note, all the nodes are signed cryptographically by the authors so that you cannot pretend that someone else did a fork. If you do a fork, you are signing both sides of the fork so it can be proven that you're misbehaving. So you'll be taken care of later. 
but still the, the protocol must handle this. Uh, so if we take the event D1, it sees the event C1 prime in this fork, because I, I, a way to see it is that D1 cannot be aware of the other side of the fork. Um, so it's just the normal rules. But if an event can, let's say, see both sides of a fork, then it doesn't see any event created by the author of the fork. So the event D2 here uh, doesn't see C1 or C1 prime or C2 or any event created by Carol because it's kind of aware that there is a fork. So the reason we define seeing like this is that it reduces the power of a malicious individual by forking. Now, all they can do by forking is undo a bit of the past. Um, whereas if you don't have these kind of rules, they can just pretend that all kinds of history happened and confuse everyone. So this is better. But it's still not great because um, like, if you can undo what people see in the future, how do you reach agreement? Uh, so I'll take a little sidestep uh, to define a supermajority. It's just more than two thirds of the nodes in the network. Um, I don't know if I've precised it, but the fault tolerance of Parsec is a third of the nodes, uh, or less than a third of the nodes, can be malicious at the same time in one uh, network. And that's actually proven, it's been proven for decades to be the best theoretical uh, Byzantine resilience uh, consensus protocol can have. Uh, so the supermajority being two thirds, it's related to this one third. Uh, but it's got two properties. One is that a supermajority always contains a majority of honest nodes. And two supermajorities always have a honest node in common. Uh, so this is going to be useful for the next concept, which is strongly seeing. Uh, so we've seen that seeing allows malicious nodes to undo the history in the future. Strongly seeing is a step towards removing this problem. Uh, so the, the definition for strongly seeing, but I'll show it in examples because it's easier, is an event, say, X strongly sees an event Y if it can see events created by a supermajority of nodes that can see event Y. But uh, let's look at an example. So I claim that A1 strongly sees B0. And the reason is that A1 sees, for instance, A0 that's created by Alice, B0 that's created by Bob, and C0 that's created by Carol, and all of these see B0. And these are three out of four, which is over two thirds, so it's a supermajority. So uh, A1 strongly sees B0. Uh, giving you one different example, just to, so say D1 strongly sees A0. And if you see, in this case, D1 can see events created by all of the nodes, which is definitely more than two thirds that see D0. So, uh, A0, sorry. So, uh, D1 strongly sees A0. Uh, and just to really drive the point home, uh, an example where strongly seeing doesn't happen, A2 does not strongly see A0. And the reason is that A2 only sees events created by Alice and Bob, which is half the network, which is less than two thirds. Uh, so th the reason we bothered and defined this strongly seeing is because if we get this nice property, if an event X strongly sees an event Y, no other event can strongly see an event by Y's creator that's on another branch of a fork. So this kind of solves the problem with undoing history in the future. Uh, and I've been uh, promising to defend the concept of observers. We're almost there, but first, interesting event. Uh, so we want to reach consensus on something, some data, arbitrarily. And this data uh, is going to be contained in the graph. So for instance, I told you at the beginning, Bob recorded something he saw in the network in one gossip event. But some gossip events will just record that communication happened. So to kind of, it's not even necessary to do it, but we reduce the, the gossip events we care about for the purpose of consensus to stuff that we call interesting events. And for instance, it could be gossip events that contain data, or it could be more complex rules, you can define it as you want. Uh, but then reaching consensus 
based on looking at a gossip graph, um, is going to be picking uh, one of the interesting events proposed for the next and say this is the next. And when you do this, you need to be sure that other nodes do this too. So I've been showing you this uh, gossip graph from a uh, god's eye, but you need to realize that each node has their own version of the gossip graph that could be completely out of sync by, I don't know, generations and generations of gossip events. And so, um, yeah, they don't have this god view. They don't all have the same gossip graph, or else consensus would already be solved. So they have their version of the gossip graph, and they need to pick the next event so that any version of the gossip graph by other nodes will reach the same conclusion. Uh, so now the concept of observers, which I've been uh, touting. Um, so the technical definition is a gossip event that strongly sees interesting gossip events proposed by a supermajority of nodes. And because it can be a bit abstract, I'm going to image again. Uh, so we've already seen that A2 does not strongly see A0. So in this example, I'm saying that A0, B0, C0, and D0 are all interesting events. And we're looking for, uh, is A2 an observer or not? Um, OK, so A2 strongly sees B0. Uh, you can just see that like the, the blue path covers all the nodes. Uh, B2 strongly sees C0, and B2 strongly sees D0. So B2 strongly sees three of the four interesting events. Uh, and that's a supermajority. So that makes the event A2 an observer. Uh, and now we're able to do something nice with this definition of observer. Uh, you can see the fact that the observer strongly sees a specific inter interesting event as a vote of confidence that this interesting event, no interesting event on a fork of this one, will uh, be strongly seen by anyone. Uh, so what this says is basically that at the time of event A2, Alice knows that uh, B0, C0, and D0 will eventually be strongly seen by other nodes, but it doesn't know for A0. Um, and then you can use this as the input to uh, meta-election. So the meta-election, it's going to be some kind of vote between the members of the section, where each observer is going to answer the question, do I strongly see this specific interesting event? Or rather, do I strongly see an interesting event created by Alice? And then there is another one that goes, uh, do I strongly see an interesting event created by Bob? And it covers all the nodes. So there are as many meta-elections as there are nodes. Uh, and so the answer to this question is a binary value, it's yes or no. Uh, and it turns out agreeing on a binary value is simpler than agreeing on arbitrary data, on the order of arbitrary data. Uh, and that's called a binary value consensus. And in fact, it's so much simpler that there is actually a pretty nice way to do it that was already uh, in the literature for a few years. Uh, and this way is, uh, it's this white paper, signature-free asynchronous Byzantine consensus with less than a third of faulty nodes and complexity n squared. So now if you've been following, the complexity n squared must make you a bit uncomfortable, uh, but the, they describe their binary consensus protocol in a context of broadcast. So what we did is simply take the same fundamentals and port them to the context of gossip. And so then you can get uh, nodes to agree on which nodes should be considered for the next interesting event. And then tie-breaking this is easy. For instance, if they have, uh, everyone says Bob, Carol, and Dave should suggest the next interesting event. If everyone agrees on that, then you can just pick the one with the biggest hash or some random tie-breaking uh, rule. Uh, so, so we used this uh, solution for binary agreement with an adaptation of moving it to gossip. And another adaptation, which is that uh, this uh, paper was not so simple because of one step called the common coin. And the common coin is uh, a primitive. Basically, it's like all the nodes 
flip a coin and the outcome is random and unpredictable, but they all get the same one. And turns out that's not an easy construct to make. You need something like distributed key generations, and then it becomes expensive to add nodes to the network. So anyway, it's just not that simple. So we used an ID from uh, a paper from Silvio Micali from Algorand called Byzantine Agreement Made Trivial, which was released actually uh, just before Parsec. Like we saw this and we were looking at how do we do a good common coin and we were like, okay, this is better. So we, we've got a concrete coin instead of the common coin. And with these components, the problem of consensus protocol is solved for us. Um, and the properties we get is asynchronous-ish. Uh, so the real definition of asynchronous is that uh, the adversary can control the order of delivery of any message in the network, and that's a strong, uh, and so that shouldn't affect uh, liveness. So it means the protocol should still always give a result. And there is one step in our protocol that is not theoretically asynchronous, and that's the way we defined a concrete coin. Although, uh, caveat, we think we can fix that. We are just currently focused on implementing the white paper we've written, and then we'll go, go back into it and try to fix it. And other caveat, we think that the way we defined our concrete coin is sufficiently asynchronous in practice for, the, for our purposes. Uh, but of course, we are going to have to test that if we don't find a truly asynchronous uh, academically uh, solution. Okay, we get scalability because complexity is n log n, which is uh, so n log n to reach a decision, which is the same as kind of an optimal co complexity for communicating in a resilient manner. Uh, it works in a permissionless setting, so it's resilient to a third minus one of uh, malicious nodes, and nodes can be added and removed from the network. Uh, the way this is done is basically by reaching consensus on who gets added and who gets removed, so you know everyone is added and removed in the same order. Uh, it's open source. Uh, the code is GPL v3 with linking exception, and then all the interface layer of our libraries uh, in the safe network is MIT. So the low-level stuff is GPL, GPL v3 with linking exception. Um, and it's simple because we could remove the stuff like distributed key generation and everything. So the primitives behind this is like hash, cryptographic signatures, um, and then a directed acyclic graph and follow some protocol. So for a consensus protocol, it's about as simple as anything I've seen at least. Uh, and now to the next uh, bit of my talk, which is uh, the one that may interest you a bit more, uh, with Rust. So why do we use Rust? What do we like in Rust? Uh, well, first, MadeSafe switched to Rust in 2015 when it became stable. So we used to have stuff in C++, but really we want speed and security. And in C++, you can get speed, it's not too hard, but to get security, you need to work really, really hard. So with Rust, we just uh, got the trifecta that's advertised, uh, speed, security, concurrency, and so that's the same reason most projects pick Rust. Uh, but what I want to go into a bit more depth is how by using Rust for a few years, uh, what we, w the little things that we notice that are really nice and that build the entire Rust ecosystem. And it starts with an awesome community that's, uh, that meets in these kind of meetups, and that's great, and that powers the language, that uh, distributes, releases tons of cool libraries for all kinds of things, um, that does amazing tools. And in fact, we are such fans of the way the Rust community works at MadeSafe that we've even adapted the request for comments process from Rust to the Safe network so that our community can help us design our network in the same way. Uh, and uh, with uh, th one of the reasons the community in Rust is so welcoming is that it's an active effort. If you check the code of conduct, the very first uh, bullet point in there says, we are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all, regardless of level of experience and uh, other characteristics. Uh, and that's exactly how we feel at MadeSafe. In fact, with the safe network, which is secure access for everyone, 
we want to provide security for everyone, and that means not only people who are able to do encryption and be smart uh, with how they use the internet. The idea is to give security and privacy to your grandmother, to someone who is not tech savvy at all. Uh, so this awesome community builds awesome tools, uh, and it's really nice that I'm doing this talk now after the 6th of December, because you can just rest up component add Clippy, Rust format, and RLS without preview, without using some weird nightly like we used to have to. Uh, and basically, in a few words, Clippy gives you like the community reviewing your code live while you're writing it. Rust format means that when you check any code in any crate, you can not be ticked by the way they indent their code because you're just used to this format style. And the Rust language server means that the Vim versus Emacs war is over because uh, everyone won, everyone can have the nice tools, whatever your text editor is. So, love 2018. If you're not using Clippy and Rust format to fail your CI, do it, it's really nice. It just removes worries. Uh, so, now to uh, finish this talk, I'm gonna show a few ways that the Rust ecosystem helps us achieve security, uh, security and then performance. So in terms of security, of course, it starts at the borrow checker. Uh, unlike in C++, you cannot easily shoot yourself in the foot with memory. Um, so the, just that makes it leagues away of, for instance, C++. Uh, but once you've got that, and once, for instance, Clippy has caught your non-idiomatic uh, little logical mistakes, um, you need to do testing. And so I'll show you three ways we do testing uh, for Parsec, which I think are pretty cool. And so if you, if you want to look into the ways, it's pretty nice. So as, as I've just uh, kind of described Parsec, you may have seen that we like to think of things in terms of graphs. And a good way to visualize graphs, graphs is uh, in the dot format so that you can generate images like this from it. So with the dot format, you can express relationship. For instance, here you say there is uh, a relationship between A0 and A1, which is like uh, A0 is a self parent of A1. And you can then generate this image that just gives you the graph of what happened in the network. So uh, we have our code output this graph, where in some cases, for instance, when running tests or when running uh, the example. and we can then pass these graphs from dot format back into the data structures we're used to. And for that, we use POM. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's a parser framework, which makes you able to pass this kind of non quite standard thing. It's not JSON, it's, it's dot graph uh, in a pretty concise way. Uh, and so that allows us to write tests like this, functional tests, where we can say uh, pass this dot file that I may have generated and then tweaked a few things, uh, then construct a parsec, which is our main data structure, and uh, check that some invariants on this parsec hold. And you can also do pass a dot graph, and then have, that's gonna be my starting point, have some nodes communicate, check that the invariants hold, have some more nodes communicate, check that the invariants hold, etc. So that's a great way if you have one scenario that you think uh, might break your code. You, d you just, basically it's easy to sketch it in dot graph and write a test this way. Uh, but we can go one level more powerful by uh, being more generic and adding some random. So uh, we have uh, integration tests that function on a SOC testing basis where we described ourselves uh, a way to represent a Parsec um, graph. So, for instance, you don't have to say A0, then A1, then A2, and a specific order of events. You can just say, uh, I want to start with two nodes. So, in this case, I'm constructing a schedule options Genesis size 2 and Pierce to add 8. So, that's like I'm starting with two nodes and I want to add, add eight nodes to this network. Uh, and this can be generated in many ways. There are many ways to gossip. It's random, so it can there are many ways to gossip that will do this. And 
we, when we run this test with this uh, execute schedule, it will just generate one of these ways randomly and run it. And that means we can run it thousands and thousands of times. And of course, in these execute schedules, we can test many, many invariants. And a nice thing with this is as well that if we realize that we have one more invariant we want to enforce, we can add it in one place and all our integration tests get to check that invariant, whether they add nodes, remove nodes, do both, or do all kinds of things like this. Um, and so going from functional testing to integration testing, we catch the bugs we don't expect. Um, but there is one more layer of awesomeness, which is uh, using prop test for property testing. And it kind of uses some of the same concepts as the SOC testing, except instead of describing a scenario as in, I start with two nodes and add, add eight, I just say, you could start with any number of nodes between, I don't know, four and 10, whatever. You could add any number of nodes. And the property testing framework will try to generate for you the, the problem that's the most likely to find a bug in your code. So it's gonna try to run the most complex problem it can think of. And if that breaks, it will then dial back all the ways it has and try to find the smallest way to break your test based on this. So that's something I actually learned about at uh, the Rust Fest in Paris. And we were like, okay, we want this. It's really, really cool. It's not that hard to do. You just need to have this kind of declarative way of specifying your problems. And then uh, it's a bit of boilerplate, but it's not too bad. Um, and turns out this for us doesn't catch many bugs because most of the bugs are caught before at the SOC testing level, if they haven't been caught at the functional testing. But since we created this a few months ago, it caught two bugs. And these bugs had made it through thousands of iterations of SOC testing. And so for these two bugs, it's definitely worth the week or two it took us to set it up because these are the bugs that you never catch and end up in production. So I, I would strongly recommend uh, playing with prop tests if you're so inclined. Um, so, these, so, so basically with these, between like uh, the compiler, Clippy, and the different ways you can test with Rust, you can have even more security than what you get by default with just the compiler. Um, and another aspect of, of course, uh, Rust's cool stuff is performance. And how do you get performance? You don't just write code and it's fast. You need to measure, see where are the bottlenecks, and fix them. Um, and th th it's cool that in Rust, like in other languages, you can do flame graphs. You can generate flame graphs. So that's a very easy way to spot bottlenecks in your code. For instance, I can tell you right now, looking at this graph, that this is a bottleneck. Um, so w you can, like, I it's nice that in 2018 in Rust, you've got the tooling. Like, one of the things that held Rust back when it was very young was tooling was hard. But now you get the tools so you can uh, profile your code properly. Um, and once you fix the regression, you don't want it to come back. So you do benchmarking. And for that, we use the criterion um, crate, which is pretty nice. You, you basically just run cargo ben bench, and it generates these little statistical things for you. Uh, for instance, this particular fix made a 40% improvement on that particular benchmark. And that's something that was actually pushed to Parsec last week. I just grabbed the latest uh, instance of that because currently we are uh, de-pessimizing our code. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks very much. <coughs>Somewhere in the middle, you said that uh, you distinguish between a strong and non-strong uh, scene relation. Uh, but based on what size of uh, amount of nodes? I mean, if you, if you started like with 10 nodes and you lose connection to like seven of them and you decided that like super majority is based on size yeah. of three. So, so, so how you define the size? 
So you're asking me about basically how we do dynamic membership. I'll just get a graph yeah. as an example. Um, the set of valid voters, between quotes, is known at every time during the process. Okay? So let's start at a stage where we know the set of valid voters, and then say a node wants to join the network. They will uh, nag everyone in the network saying, hey, can I join? Hey, can I join? And everyone will create an interesting event that says, okay, these nodes want to join. So at the end, like at the time each of them, it could be a different time, but at the time, say, Alice realizes that Eric wants to join the network, then from her point of view, Eric is a valid voter from that point forward. And same for nodes leaving. So you maintain the invariant of everyone knows who's a valid member of the network at the time, even though it's not time, it's just in the asynchronous uh, way it works. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. Cheers. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'd like to ask about the hash graph, the technology that is pretty similar to yours. So may you summarize the differences, if any, to the yeah. hash graph? You know it, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, okay, so the part about seeing and strongly seeing is similar mm -hmm. with hash graph and uh, the idea of being based on a gossip graph, let's say, of a graph of a directed acyclic graph of gossip communications. But after that, it's different. Everything is different. So I don't remember exactly how they do it, but they have uh, witnesses and famous witnesses. And th the entire thing about this is, is different. Uh, wha so what we do is basically reduce the problem to binary uh, agreement. Uh, they, they don't do that. They have a completely different way of doing it. And one thing where we are ahead of Hashgraph in terms of our features is that they actually say, um, uh, well, okay, I, I don't, but basically there is a part in the white paper where they say, oh, and if you, and this is not theoretically asynchronous, but you can just use a common coin. And that's kind of uh, shady because just use a common coin is actually not easy. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're not quite asynchronous. So with our concrete coin, we are a step closer to being fully asynchronous, although we're not fully there yet. <laughs>